Hello and welcome to episode two of the Biology of Superheroes podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Shane Campbell Staten. I'm an evolutionary biologist and a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow. I'm joined by my co-host, Arian Darby, a marketing manager at Warner Brothers Entertainment Group, home to all of your favorite DC comic book heroes. On this month's episode, we continue our conversation about Spider-Man and his amazing webs. This time around, we focus on Peter Parker as an engineer and dig deep into the technology that he would have to master to become the web slinger. I interviewed Dr. Jonathan Klug, Director of Research and Development at Vaxis Technologies. I pick his brain about bioengineering, the cutting edge of silk technology, and get his insights into Peter Parker's origin story. So sit back, relax, and enjoy, because the Biology of Superheroes podcast starts now. So Spider-Man Homecoming uh, launched back in July, um, which is, I guess this is the, the third sort of rendition of, of Spider-Man that Sony has done um, in, the, yeah. in the movies, at least. Did you see Homecoming? I did. I got around to seeing it. Um, What'd you think? I thought it was great. It was a, it was a great uh, retelling of uh, the story. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that Sony keeps taking a different angle every time they uh, reboot the series. One of the things that's so fascinating about this, these series of films is that throughout the course of the years, Sony's selection of the character for Spider-Man, the actor portraying him, has actually gotten so much younger, uh, and I would say believably wise, closer to the true intent of how the comic books kind of portrayed Peter Parker. Uh, he was a young kid in high school, and the sense of responsibility that kind of came along with his powers uh, would probably be overwhelming. Um, yeah. And I don't know what your impression was of, of Tom Holland, but uh, in my mind, I thought he was probably the youngest Spider-Man yet. Yeah, I think I definitely he definitely came off to me as as the youngest. You know, even you know, like the last sort of rendition with Andrew Garfield, he was in high school, but he was I think a senior, right? In that in that yeah. movie, because he I think he left high school in like the second movie or something like that in that rendition and. Toby Maguire, yeah, I think he started out as like a high schooler in that. But you know, I think Toby Maguire, he was like thirty or something. Like you know, it was very yeah. obvious, you know, that <laughs> he, he was this not Uncanny Valley sort of like nineties uh, sitcom nine hundred two one zero where all the actors are like in, the, in their thirties, but <laughs> yeah. to be like super insecure and <laughs> exactly. It's just yeah, you know, this kid feels like a, a true blue freshman, Tom Holland, um, and, and so the interesting dynamic that. Sony's now set up is they've partnered with Marvel and now they've kind of combined and joined forces, narratively speaking, to bring some of the cinematic universe magic that Marvel's been executing on the Avengers side of things uh, and marrying that with the storyline of this new Spider-Man character. So we got our first taste of uh, Tom Holland's rendition of Peter Parker in Captain America's Civil War. He made a quick cameo. Uh, did some impressive work, both as kind of the character itself uh, as a superhero, uh, joining the ranks for the first time, as well as um, uh, kind of leaving the impression of uh, just how vulnerable and young he is in his home life with Aunt May. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think his youth really comes across in uh, in Civil War. I remember there's this scene where he's fighting the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and he's just really excited to be there and be prepared participating in everything and he's asking them tons of questions about how their costumes work and how winter <laughs> soldiers arm works and you know they're like we're in the middle of a fight man you're not supposed to be quizzing us on on all this stuff right now but you know he's just really young and excited to be a part of uh being you know be a part of everything that's going on i think his youth really comes across there and we also see it i think now that sony and marvel have merged at least in terms of you know this this Spider-Man story arc, we really start to see this mentoring relationship develop between um, between Spider-Man and Iron Man, right? Tony Stark and, and Peter Parker. I think that adds a lot to the storyline as well. Yeah, that's huge. <laughs> and you gotta imagine that Tony Stark um, is taking this kid under his wing and really doing a lot of the things he might have wished 
uh, he'd have access to himself when he was first starting out creating the Iron Man suit and taking on the role of this hero for the world. Uh, he sees the potential in Peter Parker, both in terms of uh, his genius kind of a, a, as a scientist, the young budding uh, mind uh, in the field of engineering and, and so on and so forth. But I think he also obviously sees his potential as a hero. His heart's in the right place, but he needs a little guidance. Uh, and, you know, what's interesting to me, uh, just in terms of the character and the maturity of uh, Tony Stark, is that uh, he's also given Peter Parker access to a new suit. It's tricked out. It's got a lot of new capabilities and functionality. But kind of wisely, uh, Tony goes with the idea of keeping a lot of the feature set under wraps and kind of password protected, right? Like you yeah. see in the movie, Tom Holland can't quite access everything in the suit because he's not ready. Um, and, you know, I think Tony's coming out of that from a good place in terms of just watching out for the kid's safety and making sure he's developing at sort of a, a comfortable speed uh, and a responsible speed. Um, yeah, and so... so so I remember, yeah. I remember when I was watching the movie, it actually reminded me a lot. Strangely enough, it reminded me of my graduate school experience, right? And I think that Tony and Peter, their relationship is very much like a professor and an incoming graduate student where, you know, you see a lot of potential. And as a graduate student, you're super excited and, you know, you just, you want to do everything, right? You just want to hit the ground running and basically just do everything you possibly can. You know, a good advisor in that situation, you know, it's typically very encouraging, but it's also like, well, why don't we focus you in on one thing for now? And why don't you work on that for a while? And then as you develop, you know, as a scientist, then, you know, we'll expand your repertoire and like give you a little bit more freedom to, to do your thing. And then you see, you know, see a lot of that sort of play out in, in the movie as well, which I, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and I, I would also say that I think as a superhero, this is probably one of the most uh, supported versions of the character uh, we've ever seen in terms of having kind of allies early on in his journey into becoming, um, you know, and fulfilling his true potential uh, as Spider-Man. Uh, so not only is Tony Stark um, arguably, if you're, you know, looking at some of the best mentors to choose from, from a superhero perspective, uh, you know, kind of the there for the journey alongside him. He also uh, let his best friend Ned know, uh, who's there to kind of back him up from uh, sort of a tech support headquarters, eye in the sky perspective. Uh, that yeah, the uh, the, kind of the voice in the 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 voice in the earpiece so to speak yeah exactly and so he has this kind of like really cool support network of people that are um sort of shouldering uh, the burden if you will of of being the hero uh and kind of helping him uh to be there for him uh which is huge especially you know you gotta imagine as growing up as a young person you've got so many other things to deal with let alone you know taking on the responsibility of watching out for the world. And I think that's also something that Tony Stark is aware of in that mentorship world where it's like, hey, this kid's got great potential, but you know, even still, there are sometimes jobs that you need to call the Avengers for. And it's not a knock on your talent or your potential, but you know, I think he's ultimately looking out for Peter's youth. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we see things with like child actors and, and kids that are put in the sports and you know, the forgotten childhoods where uh, you know, Tony wants the kid to have time to be a kid. Um, yeah. And th there's nothing wrong calling in for backup and for help. It's what the Avengers even do. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of cool life lessons that are woven into this uh, throughout the film. Yeah, I like that. You know, and I, I also really like the fact that they're really, it seemed like this movie was a lot more tech heavy um, than definitely than any of the other Spider-Man movies, but maybe even more so than like most of the other Marvel movies. I mean, obviously, you know, all the Iron Man movies were, were pretty tech heavy, but this was a pretty, I think, tech savvy movie. They deal a lot with different aspects of engineering with, you know, there's a lot of coding involved in, you know, in the plot line with Peter and Ned, you know, sitting down and looking at the code that accompany this, this new fancy suit of, you know, that, that Tony gives Peter. 
and then even on the on the sort of the flip side on the the sort of villain side of of it we also see you know there's you know a lot of tech savvy geniuses on that side as well so michael keaton plays you know the vulture who like leads this team of techno scavengers to basically rummage through all of this you know really advanced technology that was associated with the chitari invasion that happened in the avengers you know and they you know take all that alien technology and they revamp it and make all sorts of weapons and and gadgets so so that they can use them for you know for different heists and whatever different you know thieving projects they have going on yeah so i i totally agree this is probably one of the most modern takes on spider-man yet uh it's been updated for our world which is constantly being technologically advanced in pretty much every avenue and aspect of, of life. Uh, and you see that both on the villain side and the hero side, as you mentioned, with Vulture. Uh, you know, Michael Keaton is marrying that alien tech with the best practices of the human world to some pretty astounding results. Uh, and then Tony Stark with the gifting of the Spider-Man suit to Peter Parker. Uh, you know, that thing's equipped with uh karen i think the artificial intelligence system yeah uh, kind of speaks to him kind of provides a heads up display that's embedded in his islands uh there's like a reconnaissance drone i think and some other like capabilities uh as well as you know we mentioned that tony stark as a, a responsible mentor uh implemented some fail safe features and some some sort of protocols yeah, to the keep uh, the training uh, wheels protocol yeah, the training rules protocol and the the baby monitor protocol, which kind of <laughs> recorded everything <laughs> that he was doing and reported it back to Tony. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it was a, a cool modern take, uh, particularly on the Vulture, which is a character um, that, you know, might have been uh, avoided over the years. Has, has, the, has the Vulture made an appearance in a, a movie? No. So I think they hinted they hinted at the Vulture. um like right at the end of the last series. Um, yeah. You know, but, but they never actually showed the vulture, you know, in, you know, in all his glory. Yeah. You know, it, for a modern audience, cause it's a, it's an old school character. The vulture has been around for a while, but it, it may have been challenging for directors to feel like they could come up with a way to, uh, make the vulture feel relevant or cool, but I, I think they nailed it with this. And yeah. I'm a an English major, so I love the the word play and just kind of the very vulture like sense that they attributed to the character, where he's actually scavenging for yes. this alien technology, um, and that suits the character and its namesake uh, uh, very well, and in kind of a cool, cohesive tie in to the broader Marvel universe too. So again, they're kind of you know linking back that tie to the bigger world. Um, but I think tech is huge. And yeah, so this movie got me thinking, you know, a lot about the sort of engineering side of Peter Parker as as a character and as Spider-Man. You know, so on the last episode, we really focused in on the biology of webs and the sort of limits of form and function. And when when it comes to web performance. But when we think about Peter Parker as a character, there's there comes this question of how does a scientist actually go about producing this web formula, right? What is, is really involved in this? I really want to dive into the engineering aspects of biologically inspired technology. Uh, so in order to do this, I found um, a real life Peter Parker, uh, Dr. John Klug. Uh, and John is a bioengineer. Uh, he is the director of research and development at Vaxis Technologies. And he spends his life thinking about real world applications for silks and developing technology that utilizes uh, silks for all sorts of purposes. Uh, so I sat down with John and he told me a bit about how he got started working with silks. Uh, so let's take a listen. How did you get into bioengineering? Yeah, so it's, the story starts with silk. So when I was an undergrad at Tufts, um, there was a really um, interesting research program going on in the lab of David Kaplan, um, where they were taking silk textiles and weaving them into these rope structures that could be used as ligament replacements in the knee. So like, you know, the, the same idea of why they used um, sutures in a medical context, they just applied that into this really more complex setting where like 
where the knee has all these you know crazy demands on it, like mechanically speaking, right? So instead of these really fine fibers that are used for sutures, make this really thick braided rope that is going to be able to have like stand up to all the performance requirements of the knee, like be able to flex you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times and be able to like withstand all the crazy biochemistry in the knee, like all the, all the, the, uh, the stresses, the biochemical stresses that occur in the knee. So you, you mean like all the, all the strains and forces associated with like, you know, sprinting and jumping and lifting heavy exactly. weights. These... Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, because it's a, an active environment, all the cells that are in there want to break down foreign stuff. Um, you know, any implant that you put in the knee is going to be subject to all these like crazy physiological demands. So they, so the silk is great in that setting because it breaks down incredibly slowly. They knew that because that's the way that sutures performs medically. Mm -hmm. So they kind of said, you know, when we put the braided rope in the knee, um, it's going to break down really slowly. And over time, as that breakdown process continues, all of the cells that would be recruited to that site will help regrow the tissue as it's being broken down. So you eventually, over the course of like six months to a year, end up with a whole new ligament because that that braid acted as a scaffold to facilitate the regrowth of of, of the tissue. Wait a minute. So, so you t okay? So you have you have the spider silk, and then you make it into an artificial ligament, and you yep. you put that into the body, and the silk actually withstands the forces right that a normal ligament is supposed to yeah and the body yep. breaks that silk down but as it's breaking it down it replaces the silk with its own cells so you get your own ligament back at the end yeah and and that's exactly right and it was a pretty crazy concept at the time and still kind of is uh because there's you know medically you can't find products that do that right there's not nobody has a replacement you know disc for their back or uh or you know, heart valves are things that are that are you know sort of engineered products that are meant to degrade over time. It's just an incredibly challenging project. What well, what that structure was really good at doing was sending signals to the cells that were growing in that rope structure. So as the cells grew in and attached, they they were surrounded by and interpreting all these mechanical signals because they were a part of the structure and adapting to it. So as the force of you jumping was being sent to the cells, they knew, oh, shoot, I need to reinforce this structure and build more collagen around me and build all these other molecules that are going to help withstand those forces progressively more so over time. So they, it was a really, a lot of the basic science work was saying, like, how do we trick the cells in that environment to really want to produce more tissue and faster so that as that breakdown process occurred, that, that tissue that it replaced the, the silk with was getting stronger and stronger over time. So they were kind of one of the first groups to really use the silk almost like a model system to understand how cells interpreted mechanical forces and built, you know, bigger, stronger tissue in, in, in replacement of degradable materials. So it was really like, it was cool to see this, the, the biological side of it come along with the mechanical side. They've been now, they, they've extended that like so far beyond ligaments into literally every other tissue type of uh, like brain tissue, uh, corneal tissue in the eye, uh, cardiovascular tissues, bone cartilage, it's sort of like everything you can kind of imagine. And it takes, you know, all different types of structures and shapes of silk to, to do that. And so along with all that kind of interesting bioengineering work came a lot of heavy material science work where they engineered, you know, cool structures with cool, you know, properties. So, so I, I, I loved being just sort of a small part of that research program because there, you could touch a lot of cool different uh, end applications. So John really threw me for a loop with his story about how he got started because, you know, when I was thinking about the, the potential applications for spider silk, I, my mind immediately went to potential military applications, right? Thinking about uh, parachutes and ropes and body armor and this sort of stuff. But you know, one of the things that he brings up is this really, really important and useful property of silk, and that is biocompatibility, right? This ability to interact and communicate with living tissue without prompting an immune response from the body, right? So our entire immune system is built to locate and identify and get rid of foreign material, you know, which is great if you're talking about 
uh, bacteria and viruses, you know, which make us sick. But it also leads to the potential rejection of organ implants and, you know, things like artificial ligaments. Um, but this silk, you know, provides a means of developing replacement body parts while reducing this risk of, of rejection. I just think like that is a really, really cool concept. Yeah. So it sounds like John uh, started his career out on the cutting edge of, of science to begin with, which is crazy. Um, and, you know, if we're thinking about this from a comic book perspective in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, the next big tentpole film on the horizon is uh, Marvel's Infinity War. Right. So with that, you got to think like maybe Peter Parker as this young superhero um, is going to be in the middle of the action. Uh, we know that this is one of Marvel's biggest films, probably of all time, once it comes out. All of the characters we've been introduced to are going to show up and appear. The stakes are going to be massively high, and the danger is going to be at a scale we have yet to see to date, uh, given the villain that's going to be introduced. So there's going to be some carnage. There's going to be some really, really terrible stuff happening. Uh, and, you know, we got to imagine we might lose one of our heroes, but yeah, maybe even several. And so... <laughs> yeah. You know, we we think back to how we were talking about how Tony Stark took on this role as a, a mentor and somebody that's looking out for Peter Parker. Uh, you know, is he going to really allow this kid to get into the middle of the danger so deep that, you know, he might be one of the potential casualties? Uh, and after hearing what John was talking about with the properties of Silk, you know, maybe maybe Tony Stark looks at Peter Parker as like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to sideline you, kid, but I don't want you on the front lines. You have this ability with your web fluid to essentially be a suture, like a, an infield combat medic or someone that yeah. could like be there on, you know, on the front lines, sort of, but in the back, uh, assisting with heroes or people that are down and that are injured, and and kind of you know operating right there, and maybe. You know, I don't know if it, the web dispenser that Peter Parker has right now is technologically advanced enough to operate at what I would imagine is a very precise level uh, yeah. of kind of, you know, secreting the formula to act as a suture. But we've just learned that the technology is there to, you know, have people um, be healed and repaired through that. I don't know what the recovery time is like in, in our real world scenario here. Yeah. So um, we're dealing with superheroes. But we're dealing with superheroes. So, you know, I can imagine a scenario where, you know, the, Peter's able to kind of help patch someone up and the guy's able to at least make it off the field of battle uh, and, and recover in safety. So, yeah. Uh, and we, you yeah. know, we've seen in, in the comic books, you know, he's used his, um, you know, Spider Man has used his webs for, you know, to make uh, like a sling and things like this, you know, right. where, you know, but this sort of takes it to the next level where you're not just making a sling, but you're actually, it's like something happens and you tore a ligament and then, you know, somehow you're using, he's using this, this web formula to create, you know, a temporary ligament so that he can, you know, so that he can continue to fight or something like that. It opens up a really, a really interesting set of, of potential scenarios to, to go with in the comic book universe. Yeah, totally. So that's how John got started uh, in this field of bio-inspired engineering. And, you know, but he's been doing this for a while now. Now he's the director of research and development at this really awesome startup company called Vaxis Technologies. So I asked him a little bit more about where we are now and what is the state of the art in terms of what they're trying to accomplish with spider silks. So let's see what he had to say. So right now you're the director of, um, of research and development at yep. Vaxis? Vaxis Technologies, yep. Oh. So what, what, what happens at, at Vaxis? So at Vaxis, we, we're a technology company. The, the, the biggest thrust right now is to build transdermal patches that can deliver vaccines. Um, so a patch you can put on the arm that delivers um, vaccine components into the skin and in doing so can make the administration of the vaccines easier and more pain-free. And potentially, based on like the um, kind of the cool features of the technology, make the vaccines more more potent, um, more efficacious. These patches that we're building for the arm, they're actually made into these really sharp, what are called micro needles. These little projections that are very sharp at the end of at the end of this patch, and they're a couple hundred microns in size. The silk actually makes up the structure of those needles, and they need to be strong enough to penetrate the outer layer of the skin. So if the silk is very strong, um, but 
um, is very slow to degrade, what that's going to enable you to do is penetrate the skin and put the depot of silk in there containing the vaccine to very slowly release the, those those vaccine um, antigens. So that's kind of like the main thrust of the company. It actually started using silk um, as a way to just simply address the issues of the cold chain for vaccine distribution. So like you have a vaccine that is really unstable because of the proteins or whatever is in that material. And we're going to add silk to it to make it more like robust so that when they need to take it out of the cold chain, like at the last mile where they have to get into a rural vi village, um, that it's going to be able to maintain the potency of the vaccine so that when it finally gets administered, um, it has the same profile as when it got manufactured. So you're using uh, like silk as like a stabilizing agent at, at room temperature. At room temperature, exactly. Okay. That's cool. But then a group at MIT made the discovery that you could actually build it into these more complex devices that could be applied to the skin. So use these stabilizing features, but in addition, make the delivery of the vaccine better, uh, less painful, you know, easier for an end healthcare worker to do. Um, and then also as a, a cool feature for the manufacturers, potentially reduce the amount of vaccine they have to build into these devices. So it saves them costs, um, you know, reduce the, the, the total amount of bulk they have to put in. So as you can see, they're using silks for, you know, for things that I just, I never thought silks could be used for, you know, not only are they replacing ligaments, but they're making patches, you know, for the administration of, of drugs where the patches themselves are made of silk, the, the needles that they're injecting the vaccines with are made of silk, but then even the vaccines themselves are, are dosed with silk to help stabilize the vaccine. It just opens up a lot of different avenues for, uh, for biological and technological innovation, which I think is, is, is really, really cool. You know, so, you know, again, if we bring this back to, you know, what this can mean for Peter Parker and, you know, and Spider-Man, it just, it potentially adds a lot to his toolkit, right? So one of the common tropes with Spider-Man is that there are all of these, villains or would-be villains that take some sort of a serum that is supposed to give them super strength or, you know, supposed to endow them with some power that they felt that they were robbed of or were missing from their, their regular life. And then they, they take this serum and then they become some sort of monster or they go insane uh, and then they just start rampaging on New York City. All right. So one of the classic examples of of this is, is Dr. Kurt Connors, right? Who was previously a mentor for Peter Parker. Uh, he's a bioengineer at Oscorp who lost his, his right arm. It was, you know, it was amputated and he became obsessed with limb regeneration, right? So he develops this serum that allows him to regenerate his arm, but then it turns him into this giant lizard monster. And then he rampages on New York City and starts destroying things and, you know, is living in the sewer and all kinds of nonsense. And then Peter Parker has to go and, you know, and try to save his, you know, his mentor and cure him of, of this serum that turned him into a giant lizard. And now we have you know, this, you know, this potential application where, you know, he can, you know, use his silk to develop a patch to, you know, administer that antidote to, you know, to Dr. Kurt Connors. So, the, you know, the point is like in that situation, we now have a realistic place to go to, to sort of feed that story. Peter Parker potentially modifying his silk to develop, you know, this transdermal patch that he can then use to, you know, administer the anecdote to the serum to save his, you know, to save his mentor. Um, so I think that that's a, you know, really cool potential, you know, addition to, to Spider-Man's toolkit. And so, yeah, throughout the course of the comics and the movies, we've seen Spider-Man usually use his silk and webbing proactively as a restraining tool, a weapon, and something that uh, is essentially employed with force against the people he's um, combating against. But now that we kind of understand the research and the further properties that silk has through the work that John and his team have done, uh, you know, in the literal heat of battle, what better tech application as a hero could you want to have, uh, particularly as a hero like Spider-Man is? Uh, Peter Parker cares uh, at the end of the day about the people he's facing against uh, and their struggles. Uh, and he always attempts to kind of understand where they come from. And so if he can help you, he will. Uh, and I think with a technology like this, uh, we could see that employed to great usage. 
Um, you know, we've seen countless times in the comic books that he's kind of gone almost out of his way to his detriment to, uh, you know, help someone. Uh, we saw it in his compassion toward the vulture in Homecoming at the end of the movie. So I can imagine, like you already mentioned it with a character like Kurt Connors, uh, Peter kind of going the extra mile and looking to develop a way to help him recover from sort of this illness that he kind of self-inflicted upon himself. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, Flint Marco with uh, becoming Sandman. Maybe there's a similar vaccinated approach uh, that could be used in that instance to help him return to a normal life. So, you know, I think it's fascinating um, that John has kind of stumbled upon this application. Uh, and it's certainly something that I don't think we've seen explored before, even in the fictional world, which makes biology and science in the real world so cool. Yeah, exactly. Are kind of cross like influencing each other and the ideas are, are sort of cross pollinating and it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows? Like maybe, you know, we'll actually see, um, you know, some sort of stylized or fantasized version of this technology play out uh, in future uh, Spider-Man movies or even in the comic books. Uh, so we're talking about all these different uses for spider silk and we see that Peter Parker, you know, he's, you know, donning his, you know, his Spider-Man outfit every night and he's going out and he's using massive amounts of silk, you know, to, you know, swing from place to place to string up bad guys for all these different purposes. And at some point thinking about this from a realistic standpoint, at some point there has to be a production issue, right? He has to actually produce all of these, um, all of these web cartridges that he's using, you know, to, to accomplish all of these feats. So for instance, I remember watching, um, the Spider-Man cartoons on, on Fox kids, right? I mean, that was, you know, that was like probably my first introduction to Spider-Man as a character was, was through those, uh, was through that, that TV show. I think it was like the late nineties, early 2000s, something like that. Yep. And I remember, Almost every episode of this show, you know, he would run out of, you know, he'd be swinging from, you know, from rooftop to rooftop. And then mid swing, he would run out of his web formula and then he would start falling towards the streets of New York City and then they would cut to commercial. All right. And it's always super <laughs> stressful for me as a kid watching this. And, you know, but it brings up this this uh, this question of how does he actually produce so much silk? And this is a limitation that scientists in the real world have to think about as well, right? If you're designing, you know, silks for, uh, for biomedical purposes, if you're um, trying to design te textiles made out of silks, right? There's this issue of actually getting organisms to produce the silk that you need, right? And when we think about spiders, right, there's a lot of limitations with, with keeping spiders, right? You know, so in the movies, we see that the spider that that bit Peter Parker to cause him to become Spider-Man, right, comes from Oscorp where they, you know, they're doing some sort of crazy experiment to produce these spiders. You know, but when we think about farming spiders, right, in the real world, there are a lot of limitations. First of all, spiders are territorial, you know, which means you can't keep a lot of them together. They're really small, which means that they don't produce all that much silk. They're aggressive, which makes them potentially dangerous to work with. You know, so how do scientists actually get around this in, in the lab? So I actually asked John, how do you go about producing copious amounts of silk for various purposes um, in the real world, in the lab? People have been trying to make silk synthetically um, for a long time, certainly since the 80s, at least when recombinant like technology first came into play. So the idea of like producing it in E. coli or some other or yeast and producing it large quantities. What they found as the major roadblock was that silk is very difficult to produce at high yield with it with the sort of same high molecular weight or so the same size of silk proteins that you find in nature. And what they found is that when they made the smaller versions of silk, they just couldn't enable the same types of cool structures um, uh, when, they, when they were making the kind of the kind of distilled crappy version of the silk. When you say recombinant, you're talking about taking these genes in yep. spiders yeah. and you're implanting those genes into other organisms. Yeah. Right. And then you can get those other organisms to produce silk. Yep. I've read that they've been taking these silk genes you know, from animals that naturally produce silk, you know, like silkworms and spiders, yeah. and they've been inserting them into things like goats and like mammals. 
Yeah, so so Randy Lewis's group in Utah was like really pushing that for a long time and continues to to pursue that avenue because he's trying to address the yield issue, right? So can you go into a, an organism that's just bigger than E. coli, like on the other end of the spectrum, into a mammal, right, that is able to produce this in their milk and actually get the yield to a point that you can actually make the sorts of textiles and cool structures that, that they've always tried to, you know, explore with silks. Um, so they've, so that's been like a very different take on things and you have the pop culture literature has kind of taken that and run with it. <laughs> so Silk and Goat, look that up. You're going to find all sorts of crazy uh, like Reddit posts and things like that. So as you can see, one of the common solutions to this limitation in production is actually getting other organisms like larger organisms or organisms that are better at producing silk to actually produce spider silk. Right? And you know, the way we do that is through, um, is through recombinant technology, right? So in order to make a recombinant organism, in this case, right, you take a gene from a spider that produces silk, right? Well, we, these are called um, spidroin genes, and you can use various recombinant technologies. The newest of these techniques is called CRISPR-Cas9, right? Which is um, essentially co-opted from the immune system of uh, bacteria and other prokaryotes and it allows you to really precisely uh, cut and paste genes into a host genome all right so you use the cellular machinery of that host to express the gene of interest in this case these spidroin genes that you know that produce spider silk and uh, and you get that cellular machinery to to produce the silk proteins yeah, so the science went way over my head on this one. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. You know, I think at the end of the day, though, it's it's fascinating. The science behind it is interesting. Being able to have access to a larger supply of silk, which I, I think is, from a scientific perspective, the, the solution that was being sought after in terms of dealing with recombinant technology, um, just opens the playing field to come up with new innovations. Uh, and so, you know, in the comic book world, Peter Parker is obviously dealing with a lot of the same uh, limitations. The, you know, the canisters that hold his web fluid can only um, contain so much. Uh, you know, sourcing isn't necessarily an issue because I'm assuming he's using some sort of artificial um, tech to create his web fluid at the moment. But, uh, you know, as a young budding scientist, you gotta imagine he's keeping his eye on the latest advances in the field. And certainly if you were to hear of stories of this, it would get his gears turning. Um, and we know that one of his greatest powers outside of the abilities that he inherited as the character of Spider-Man is, you know, his mind. He's a, a genius. Absolutely. Um, you know, what John has been telling me is or got me thinking about Peter Parker a little bit more deeply as an engineer and as a scientist as a whole, right? Sort of what are the types of things that he would have to do in order to get everything that he needed to be Spider-Man. So using this recombinant technology, I think it opens up just yet another dimension of engineering that Peter Parker would potentially have to master in order to, you know, you know, really polish his, his web formula. Right? And I don't. I have never like read or seen the specifics of, of what he uses to design his his web formula, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility that you know he's using some of this type of technology to perfect this formula of his. So you know, scientists have used recombinant strains of E. coli or yeast to produce silk in a petri dish, for instance. Or you can use recombinant types of plants, things like tobacco or soybeans or potatoes, to then produce an entire crop of silk, right? Or you can use silk worms, which have been bred for thousands of years to produce large amounts of silk. And you can insert the spider silk genes into those silk worms and you know, have those silk worms produce silk that's more spider-like, you know, which would, which would potentially make them a lot stronger. Um, but even given this, right, there's a lot of limitations, right? So when we're talking about recombinant technology, you're taking a gene from one organism and implanting that into a different genome, which in some cases, you know, may be millions of years removed from a common ancestor, right? So this leads to potential incompatibility issues and imperfections in the final product, right? So the decreased quality of, of these proteins, which is what John was talking about, right? But it's really interesting to imagine 
you know, Peter Parker as a young scientist down in his basement working with E. coli or yeast and spiders and like making these recombinant um, strains of yeast that would allow him to produce uh, spider silk in a, in a Petri dish. You know, it sort of further speaks to how brilliant, you know, this kid must be in order to actually do what he does. So, so far talking about Spider-Man and his amazing web formula, right? We have this potential way that he could go about designing this web formula using, you know, choosing really interesting species like the Darwin's bark spider, which we talked about in episode one, um, potentially using, you know, recombinant technology, you know, to solve the production issue. But even once you're there, right, there's still a lot of, there's still another major issue. And that is actually shooting that web silk, right? So like just having a cartridge of, of a web formula only gets you so far. It's really cool, right? It's a great scientific innovation, but it's not exactly superhero worthy. You know, one of the trademark tools that Spider-Man has is his web shooters. So we've talked about, you know, how he would, you know, make this formula, but he also needs the tech to deploy it. So I asked John how scientists in the real world actually deploy these you know, different types of spider silks that they've designed uh, in the laboratory. People for a, a long time have looked at these um, fabrication processes like electro spinning um, or just sort of a, um, uh, extrusion into, into solution baths where, you know, the silk is in the protein form, is in water, it gets pushed into a bath that's a completely different types of, of solution. And that forces the silk to kind of want to associate with itself and remove water. And in doing so, forms that solid structure that then you can finally grab onto and pull out of the of the of the second solution. Okay. Um, so what? So this this electro spinning that you mentioned, I've, I yeah, I read a little bit about this, right? And it seems yeah. like, you know, if Peter Parker were to actually design these spinnerets, they would probably be using this electro spinning technique. It's pro yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So you have like you know. <laughs> Maybe it'd be a bit of a liability for him to have a high voltage power source like strapped to his body, but he could definitely make things very, very quickly using that technique. Yeah. And so can you give me like the basics of how this electro spinning works? Like how does electro spinning make a liquid into you know, an actual fiber? So all these solutions can carry charge. Um, and generally the simplest setup that you'll find in a lab or in um, – uh, for electro spinning involves like um, creating a, a voltage potential. So you have like a the source where the solution's coming through, and that's like usually a little needle. There is a force that wants to keep the fluid inside of that um, small needle. Okay, the same force that drives blood into a small capillary tube. And then as you push it out, so we can use like a syringe pump to push it out. As that happens, the, the solution wants to eventually um, leave that and form a droplet. But as long as the solution is viscous enough, it'll stay at the end of that tip for long enough that when you apply a uh, voltage to it, um, you can draw the protein out of that um, continuously. So you find some other surface that you apply sort of a, a negative charge, if you will, that acts as the ground. And the fluid carries that charge towards the target. But this thing that emerges, this what emerges from the drop is not stable in that setting. Like an electric field between those two positions is very chaotic. So there's okay. sort of a lot going on. So as a result, that drop um, starts flailing around like crazy. So when you have a, a sort of an unstable drop, what emerges is sort of the spaghetti-like fibril that um, gets deposited on that grounded surface. And you can, with enough time, build up a really thick material um, that doesn't that look like a textile as one continuous drawn-out fiber. It's more like a mat, like a, like a, like a bowl of spaghetti. Okay. Um, so when we think about like making a controllable electrospinning process, a lot of people have put research into making that process less chaotic and aligning those fibers to be drawn continuously from that from that needle that produces it. Um, so it gets into um, a lot of sort of uh, solution physics and biophysics that is probably over my head. Yeah. But it is. Um, 
but can be applied. It's not just a silk phenomenon. You can do this with a lot of other polymer materials. Okay. So if we're thinking about Peter Parker's spinnerets, um, the technology, does it's not quite there to, right, to make that a reality, it seems like. Yeah. The people that are, um, that are doing it in the lab have done some crazy great things with electrospinning. But generally speaking, it works well in the lab, but is, is a process that's hard to scale and to do fast, right? In the way that Peter Parker would have to produce it really quickly to be done on demand, right? Yeah. Uh, whatever setting he's in. Yeah, so it sounds like the, the physics and the biophysics uh, that are incorporated into this tech are, are super advanced. Um, and even just in terms of the application from uh, the perspective of could we have a real life pair of web shooters in our world today? Uh, you know, as you mentioned, it sounds like the answer is not quite yet, but uh, just thinking about how Peter has put together web spinners in the past uh, and now reflecting on the theoretical tech that goes into the web shooters, um, there's a lot to balance and, and play with there. Uh, so even just from the science of getting the web fluid out, uh, we've heard that uh, there's a lot to consider. We know that the structure of the web shooters themselves uh, in the sense of being incorporated in the middle of combat uh, it has to withstand uh, strength from enemies that may be superior to Peter Parker's own, where, you know, if somebody grabs onto his wrist and squeezes down and clamps down, like, that could destroy the web shooters. Uh, I'm sure temperature plays a role in terms of uh, web fluid excretion and what's the optimal uh, balance to maintain there. So, uh, you know, we got a really good peek behind the curtain of uh, just the science that would go into this. Um, you know, and even just a, an appreciation theoretically of what Peter Parker as a character would be able to accomplish uh, in, a, in, in being able to pull this off. Yeah, so I think that there are some, some major innovations needed to actually deploy the webs in the way that we see in the comic books and in movies, right? So we need pretty major advances in both mechanical and electrical engineering, right? So on one hand, you need you know, sort of self-contained high voltage device in order to actually do the electro spinning, you know, something that was both energy efficient and durable. But then also Peter Parker would have to perfect the mechanism for accurate aiming and deploying of, uh, of, this, of this web formula. So one of the things that John was talking about is you can get a fiber out of solution, but it's a very chaotic process, right? And if you're Spider-Man, you actually need to be able to accurately aim if you're going to, you know, hit a target on a building in order to, you know, swing from place to place. If you're going to hit an enemy, you need your device to be, you know, extremely accurate and, and precise in, you know, in how it deploys this web formula. And it seems like electro spinning as we know it right now um, just isn't isn't on that level. So given everything that we've talked about with Peter Parker and Spider-Man Given his role as a bioengineer and putting together all the different pieces he would need um, to design this web formula, I wanted to get John's perspective on the character's origin story as a whole. Just get his engineer's um, perspective on Spider-Man. So I actually sent John a copy of The Ultimate Spider-Man Volume 1 from 2009, uh, which was written by uh, Brian Michael Bendis and illustrated by Michael Bagley, I believe. And I got his thoughts on sort of Peter Parker's story and how it relates to his understanding of silk bioengineering. So let's hear what he had to say. He actually talks about like trying to perfect forming the web. And he sort of, I think he was talking about how he had, like he took his dad's formulation and he like took it to the next level. And I was, and just sort of the concept that it was like, like his dad had worked on it and there was this sort of like formula that was great, and then he did something. I don't even know what he did, um, but he sort he of did science, it. John. Yeah, he, he did. Science. did he science the crap out of it. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but I thought it was still, it was still kind of um, reminiscent of like what's happened in the last few years of like the silk world, right? So they, mm. so people have taken all new slants on trying to make the best silk fiber in the world, right? And they took a basic protein molecular biology approach, they took a material science approach, they did all these things, and people have contributed to the field and added different layers, but ultimately, you know, it takes sort of these 
five to ten year increments to really see these big leaps occur. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of what reminded me a little bit about how the story arc has evolved for Silk is that you have, you know, people that are building on various different findings um, and have to go across disciplines to, to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. And now we're having these breakthroughs in these, let's say, Vaxis technologies that are find, kind of finally finding the sweet spot and, and understanding it to the point that you can really make something useful. So I was like, you know what, this is the, the this is the Peter Parker's like going to make the next greatest version of it. And then there'll be Peter Parker, too, that'll, you know, that'll make an even better fiber later. And I'm excited to see, you know, yeah. <laughs> souped up version of Spider-Man, like in the next iteration. Fiction mimics fact in, in that sense. Yes, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I think um, John kind of brings it nicely back to the conversation we started earlier about mentorship and this idea uh, that I think is obviously prevalent in science in terms of just successive innovation. Uh, and if you take a look again at the relationship between Tony Stark and Peter Parker, uh, the movie ends in Homecoming with Tony essentially offering Peter a chance to um, unlock the wonders of the world of his suit if he only joins up with the Avengers and stays uh, with Tony and the rest of the team at the headquarters. Uh, but I think Peter, in kind of uh, a display of some wisdom beyond his years, has kind of taken some time to reflect upon what it means to be a superhero uh, for him and actually declines Tony's offer and uh, decides to go back to New York and kind of do his own thing for a little bit. And so you got to imagine, you know, he's obviously seen some of the potential of what the suit can do. He's gotten some ideas from Tony Stark. Uh, and I think he's going to be able to take it upon himself to define what it means to be a hero, both in terms of the values uh, that he believes in, as well as the tech that um, sort of makes up the suit, uh, enhances the abilities that he's been gifted with. Yeah, so, and, I, and I think that, you know, essentially what, what you just said, I think it applies to, you know, to science as a field as, as well. So science is a, is a field as a whole that builds on past innovation. Past innovations breed future innovations. That's just sort of how the field works. And that innovation comes partly through this idea of mentorship, right? So taking the experiences of those that have greater exposure to questions and greater experience with technology and using that to sort of further the field, right, by bringing a fresh perspective to it, but then also just participating in a community that has collectively built on historical findings, All right? So, you know, it'd be really interesting to see where this relationship between Tony and Peter goes, sort of moving on, you know, in the future, sort of merging the sort of technological innovation that Tony is known for, you know, with the specialties that Peter Parker is, you know, is developing, you know, as he goes about tinkering and further designing, you know, his own suit and weaponry uh, and his arsenal in order to, uh, in order to stop bad guys. I think that also, you know, one of the things that, that John brought up was this idea of, of the future, like what happens beyond Peter Parker, taking that web formula, you know, a ways and then sort of passing it on to further innovate. And that sort of brings me back to the movie. Some people you know, may have realized this, maybe some didn't, but the newest version of Spider-Man, uh, Miles Morales, was actually hinted at in the movie. Uh, so Miles Morales is this young, gay, Afro-Latino kid uh, from Brooklyn who eventually takes up the mantle of, um, of Spider-Man. And Peter Parker actually becomes a mentor uh, to Miles Morales. It'll be interesting to see how that mentorship plays out uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you bring up a really interesting point. It's like, how is Peter going to inspire the next generation of heroes? Um, and, you know, talking about Miles Morales, I thought it was really clever how Marvel uh, sort of hinted at that character for fans uh, back when uh, I think Sony was looking to reboot the series uh, again with now their eventual choice of Tom Ho Holland as the lead role, uh, there is a really strong underground sort of swelling and petition from fans uh, within the Marvel Universe to have Donald Glover take on the character of Marvel or of uh, Miles Morales uh, as the title lead for the next franchise. Uh, and so, you know, obviously we didn't quite get that scenario, but I think 
uh, it, it just gives a little bit of a kudos to Marvel for listening to the fans and figuring out a way to kind of give a nod for that desire from the fans uh, and also to sort of work that character into the fiction uh, in sort of an unexpected but cool way. Uh, so, you know, Donald Glover appears in the movie, uh, he's related to Miles Morales, and it leaves the door open for, uh, you know, that next generation character to be inspired by uh, what Peter is doing now in the films. Uh, and what's so cool about Marvel's roadmap and universe is that they've planned this thing out pretty far in advance. And so, uh, you know, I think it definitely could be interesting to see where things go uh, in the future, uh, especially after the fallout of what we're probably going to see in Infinity War, because you got to imagine a lot of things are going to change, but it's also going to open the door for brand new possibilities. And that's exciting. Yeah, I completely agree. So I had one more question for John. Uh, I just wanted to nerd out with him a little bit about uh, about superpowers and what superpower he would imagine himself having. Uh, so let's see what, what he had to say about that. Before you go, I wanted to ask you uh, one more general question. Okay. If you had any superpower, what would it be and why? The flying thing is like, Really cool. Like I, like my dreams. You had a lot of the flying dreams, oh, yeah. <laughs> especially when I was growing up. So I was like, that's got to be deeply rooted as like a really, uh, uh, you know, something that like deep down I I, I want to have the power of. So Superman, Superman is is probably like my guy. Okay. Um, yeah. Man. So in practice, you're the closest thing that we could get to Peter Parker in the real world. But in, yes. <laughs> uh, in, in fantasy, you you want to be you want to be the Man of Steel. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. So I think that about wraps it up for uh, for this episode. Uh, it's been really interesting to sort of take a a deeper look into Peter Parker as as an engineer and explore exactly you know what sort of technological and biological innovations he would have to come up with um, in order to you know, fully realize his, his potential as a superhero. Again, this, this speaks to how brilliant Peter Parker must be as, as an individual. You know, not only do, would he have to you know, get bit by the spider and get all these, uh, all these powers, but he would really have to use his intellectual acumen to make some major advances across you know, fields of bioengineering, potentially chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. He would have to bring a very diverse toolkit to bear on on the problems presented to him as Spider-Man. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And I think that's something about the character that's always been so admirable is that, yeah, he's been blessed and gifted with some pretty enhanced and amazing uh, natural abilities, but he's never taken the easy way out. Uh, and he's always looking to strive to be better and to improve himself and to iterate upon, you know, his successes in terms of the tech that he's developed uh, for his superhero practice. Um, you know, and it'll be exciting to see what people are able to come up with in the future, uh, both in the real world and in the cinematic universe. Absolutely. Well, thanks again so much for being in the lab with me and going on this journey. Yes, sir. Always a pleasure. Till next time. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care, everyone. Peace. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation about Spider-Man and his amazing webs. Stay tuned for episode three next month when Arian and I discuss the classic Flash of Two Worlds and the comic book multiverse. I sit down with Dr. Jonathan Lossus, an evolutionary biologist and author of the book Improbable Destinies, Fate, chance in the future of evolution. We talk about the role of fate and chance in shaping the world around us and what would happen if we could replay the tape of evolution on parallel worlds. If you like what you've heard, like us on Facebook and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. Send us your questions on Facebook or email us at biologistsuperheroes at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in and stay curious.